We're here to answer your game, gaming, or game night questions. Tonight's question comes from one of our awesome Patreon patrons, Math Guy Dave, who asks, Hey, Tabletop Bellhop, what are the best games to take on vacation? Well, so thanks for the great question, Dave, and of course, for supporting our show. A quick reminder, you can support us at patreon.com slash tabletop bellhop. In addition to helping us keep this show going, you also get access to behind-the-scenes blog posts, copies of our pre-production show notes, access to our private Discord channel, and hours of bonus audio each week. Now, with that short bit of self-promotion done, let's move on to Dave's question. So, great games for vacation. What kind of games are good for a vacation? Well, that's going to completely depend on what kind of vacation you are on. There's lots of different ways people try to unwind. The games you bring to the beach are going to be completely different from the games you bring on a pub crawl, which are also going to be different from the games you bring to the cottage. Now, since Dave didn't specify, and I don't want to leave anything out, today's game list is going to be a little bit longer than usual, as I wanted to include games for basically any type of vacation you may be planning. If you're going to tour the Large Hadron Collider, weekend in the Antarctic, or go hyping up Mauna Kea, or more likely something a bit more local and budget-friendly. Now I feel like all of those are Tales from the Loop plots. I don't know why. Like every one, like if I ever had to run it, now I have a campaign idea. So I couldn't list every game that anyone could bring on any vacation. So I decided to sit back and think about all the games that I have brought with us, whether it's vacation with the kids or if it's just Deanna or I, or if we're going to visit family or we're going to a beach versus going to on a pub crawl. And I looked at what the games I tighten the pack have in common. So the first thing I want in a vacation game is something quick, which is not something you usually hear from me. Now, I, this doesn't have to be like five minute games or even 30 minute games, but you and I, we probably want to save the three hour plus epic games for a regular game night at home with your regular group. And I don't know, I, I'm not going to be playing Twilight Imperium in my hotel room. Now, vacation time to me is one of those times where I am perfectly happy playing a nice quick game multiple times over and over again. Now, the one exception for this might be if you're heading to the cottage for a long haul and you want to have something meaty for a rainy day. Mm. But I think generally we're playing, planning the sunny day list here. Yes. We might want a rainy day fun list at some point, other point. Yeah, I guess the one caveat is also packed a Twilight Imperium just in case <laughs> or a long epic game of choice. But no, I'm not going to be talking about those kind of games tonight. Now, the next thing I look for, which is also strange for me, is lighter games. Yes, I like brain burning games. I like heavier euros. I like long term strategy and engine builders. But that's not what I want when I'm just trying to relax and chill. When I'm vacation, I want games that are part of an experience, not the experience. I want to be playing games on my vacation, not playing games while I'm on vacation. I want to take in where I am, socialize, enjoy the view, the crowd, the atmosphere, the drinks, the food, and the company while playing something. So for me, this is where the games, uh, the best games have that balance of strategy uh, with lightweight and it should mean something, but uh, it should mean something, but not distract from the conversation or relaxation. Yeah, I don't want something where it's going to take all of my focus. Not in this case. Now, the other thing I'm looking for when I'm on a holiday is to have fun. I am looking for games that are more fun and don't feel like work. And while I do find heavier games rewarding in the end, that's not what I want when I'm trying to relax. This is the one time where party games can be great. I want to laugh, have fun, forget my troubles. The entire point of a vacation is to relax and enjoy yourself and leave your other problems behind. And light, fun, quick games do that the best. The last thing you want is to end up spending the rest of the time after the game stressing out about losing or overthinking what you could have done differently. Now, another consideration is game size um, and, and also game weight. Now, this is both due to the fact that you often don't know how big a playing surface you're going to find. Plus... You may be packing, well, you probably are packing whatever game you're bringing, unless you're doing like a road trip and you just throw it in the trunk or something. You got to worry about this. So one of the games that almost made our list tonight is Climbers. Nice, light, dexterity, not dexterity, but the stacking game that looks great on the table that I guess has some dexterity elements that I can play well sober or not. But it's heavy. I don't want to throw that in my luggage, especially if I'm like paying for an onboard on a flight or something like that. So... 
I want this to um I want I want lighter games in both ways, both physically and mechanically. Yeah, unfortunately, weight becomes a a, a difficult topic to discuss when talking yes. about board games because we've got our, our game physical weight of actual mass and the actual brain mass yes i, I guess i should say game. yes I, I want light games in both ways i want light mass and light weight so <laughs> purses glove boxes fanny packs these are the sort of game sizes and convenience you should be thinking of even if you don't use any of the above everyone knows about them as a nice reference point yeah now the last thing i think you want to consider is player count um who are you going to be with uh, do you expect to be hanging out with strangers and meeting new people? Like that is a thing people do. And while I'll admit it's not something my wife would ever be interested in, some people do try to set things up to get the crowd interested. And in that case, you're going to want higher player count games. If you're possibly going on a work meeting and you need something to do after the meetings and have some social time where you can socialize, that's where you might want a really simple high count player, uh, like card game or something like that. But if you're looking for a romantic giveaway with your partner, all you need are two-player games. So perhaps you pick a bit of both just in case. So this is one of the big variances. How big is the group? Is it a couple's vacation, a full family with six kids? This can significantly shape your needs. But now on to our vacation gaming suggestions. Okay, I know that like this is the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast and everyone listening to this is probably into hobby board games. I don't think we have a lot of, you know, mom and pop family gamers who listen to our show, but I honestly think the best thing you can pack gaming wise for any trip, any vacation and something you just leave in your glove box, carry in your purse, carry it like throw it in your denim jacket, whatever is a deck of playing cards. There are so many different games to play with a standard deck that you honestly just can't go wrong. And most families already have their own personal favorites that they like to play. Personally, mine are hearts and spades. And if you're into it, toss in a crib board if that's your thing. Or one of the things my parents used to love to do is when they were on vacation is pick up a crib board wherever they went that tended to be some gaudy, geeky, thematic, wherever they happen to be crib board, like a Niagara Falls one that actually drops down or something like that. Now, to mix things up, and this is something that I would want to do, is to, before you leave for your trip, Learn a new card game. There are thousands out there. There's Hoyle Book of Games. And now that we have the internet, you can easily find a thousand trick-taking games. That way, you can at least keep things fresh and interesting so it's not sitting down to play the game you've all played a hundred times before. And that was a deck of cards. Now, sticking with the theme of cards and card games that come in small boxes, we're going to have a few of these. My first is The Game from Pandasaurus. Yes, the name is terrible. Now, this is one that Dan and I have now gotten into the habit of always taking with us on a trip. This is a difficult to win, but easy to learn cooperative game that is easy to teach to non-gamers. Like in in reality, all you're doing is counting. All you're trying to do is play the cards in order from one to 100 or 101 in a couple different stacks with one of every number in the deck. The basic concept becomes interesting because you have a small hand of cards and you're forced to play at least two a turn, even if they're big numbers apart. We really dig the game. This has become a new favorite of ours. And honestly, it takes up very little room. Like the the box holds a deck of cards split in two. You could easily put those together and ditch the box to save a few more millimeters and a couple pounds. Well, not pounds, (laughs) a couple grams. And that was just to be confusing. That game is the game. The game. Uh, note, I did not put The Mind on this list, which is another one from Hana, from, from the same publisher, from Pandasaurus, because I don't think it's social. It's a game about sitting in silence and playing cards, and I don't think that's what you want. Unless maybe you're on a meditative retreat for your vacation, then maybe you might want to consider that. So next, I've got another great cooperative small box card game, and that is Hanabi. Now, this one's funky, as you don't get to look at your own cards. The game is all about giving each other clues and interpreting those clues to build stacks of cards in different colors that go up one number at a time. Now, this is just even easy enough that you can still hang out and chat while playing, but has enough depth that even get hardcore gamers tend to dig it. Now, one thing to watch for is if you've got an all-inclusive trip, the memory elements of this game are going to get more difficult as the game goes on. And if you play it strictly according to the no table talk rules, you're probably not going to win, uh, possibly ever. 
Um, and that could get stressful depending on the kind of vacation and the kind of personality you have. But depending on you, that is Hanabi. Next, I have the Sushi Go games. This is both Sushi Go and Sushi Go Party. For gamers, I recommend Party, though it does take up a bit more space and is a bigger box and a little heavier. Uh, this is a quick playing drafting game where you're passing cards and trying to collect different sets of sushi. Each type of sushi scores differently, where like one suit might want you to get three. Once you, like, you get so many points for every three, where another might give you one point per card and so on. This is a good one for families with kids and for non-gamers as well. And the art tends to draw people in. And uh, there is the uh, uh, Sushi Go Extra. Ex there's, a, there's a newer version, which is the better one to pick up rather than just plain Sushi Go. Sushi Go uh, Party. Party, yeah, Party. What I said. Oh, it is. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> sushi Go Party is the more gamers game. Yeah. Sushi gets a little lighter and a little easier to carry. And that was Sushi Go Party. Next, the codename games. I know I'm kind of cheating here, right? I'm, I'm grouping some games, but to be honest, these just fit. This is a series of games, includes code names, duet, pictures, as well as a bunch of themed versions like Marvel and Disney. With each version, the well, sorry, which version you want is honestly going to depend on what kind of vacation you're going on and who you're going to be playing with, right? Marvel and Disney are going to be perfect for family trips, whereas duet is a fantastic date night game. Now, if you are expecting larger groups, stick with the original code names. Whereas if you actually end up on a couple's date or a, a couple's night, Duet works great as a cooperative game. There are honestly enough versions of this word guessing game that there's probably a perfect, perfect version of code names for your trip. And that was code names. All of them. Any of them. <laughs> Just pick one or two. Next, no thanks. This is the perfect travel game when you're worried about space. A tiny box doesn't take up a lot of room when playing. You just got a single set of cards, fairly small deck, and some poker chips, but like the little tiny style poker chips. In this game, you're trying not to collect cards, but you're going to get stuck with some, and you only score the lowest card in a series of uh, numbers. So if we have a run, you only score the lowest number. So if you are going to collect cards, trying to make sure they're going to run. Um, it's really simple. You get past a card, and you either have to take it or you say no thanks and put a chip on it. If you're out of chips, you're forced to take the card. That's pretty much it. This is honestly one of the best gateway games out there. This is fantastic for hooking some new gamers, as well as being good enough that even experienced groups like to play this on a relaxed game night or a filler. This is almost a must have in anyone's collection. And that is, sorry, <laughs> no thanks. It is gonna be a two half hour episode of Sean's not paying attention. Bonanza, or Bean, as we like to call it, is one I often pack for a trip if I know I'll be meeting up with other gamers, like going to a con, or just knowing it's a geeky event, or a comic con. Well, I did say a con. I guess gaming con, comic con, pop culture con, any of those. This is an easy-to-teach, quick-playing, high-player count, set collection game that is actually more about negotiation and trading than long-term strategy. The oddest part about this game, and the one thing that this is why I don't recommend it all the time for non-gamers, is there's a rule that you can't sort your hand of cards, and people have a real hard time with that. This is one you don't want for that after the work meeting meetup, because once people start drinking, they just automatically start shuffling stuff and, and sorting their cards in order. I have had so many players mess that up. So I honestly usually save this for at least somewhat experienced gamers. And that is Bean, otherwise known as Bonanza. Bonanza. Now, Red 7, this is a bit meatier than the other ones mentioned above and requires a bit more thinking when playing with the full rules. Now, it's still not what I consider complex, but it may be a bit much for kids or non-gamers. Now, the basic premise here is simple. At the end of your turn, you have to be winning. If it's your turn and you're not winning, play a card to change the rules. Now, while individual rounds of Red 7 can take minutes, uh, possibly even seconds, toss in the scoring rules and the variant card abilities for a longer experience, great for filling gaps between various vacation functions. And that is Red 7. Next, I have Yardmaster, which I have to thank Deanna for reminding me of to put on this list. Yardmaster is a train game where you're building freight trains using cards. It's almost like a card version of Ticket to Ride in that way, because you're discarding cards of different colors to collect train cards of the same colors you discarded, except you're not actually worried about routes. You're not worried about where your train's going. You're just building one train. Now, the neat bit here is that each car added to your train has to be either the same color or the same number as the card before it, and then you can store cards. 
if they don't fit, to be added to your train later, which can lead to some really fulfilling combos. And that is Yardmaster. Now, another one Deanna gets credit for is Walking in Burano. And I got to say, as soon as she said this one, I'm like, wow, what a perfect theme for a vacation game, especially if you happen to be going to Venice. Though in this game, you're actually the Venice planner for a group of buildings in Venice trying to make it as appealing as possible for both the locals and tourists. Build the colorful buildings of Burano while collecting scoring cards for distinct features, like what kind of flowers you have or how many cats are hanging around. If you play your cards right, Santa may even come visit your block, but only if you've got the most chimneys. And that is Walking in Burano. While there are games we mentioned so far are good for groups, most of them aren't great for a trip where there are just two of you. So here are some specific two-player games we think would be great to bring on vacation. All right, my first two-player game that I, I put on every two-player game list is The Duke. This is still our personal favorite. This is our favorite two-player game as well as our favorite two-player vacation game. It's got a small footprint. It's easy to clean pieces, which can be important, something we didn't mention earlier. And it has engaging chess-like gameplay that keeps us coming back time and time again. Now, this is an abstract strategy game where your pieces are two-sided tiles. Now, there's no memorizing moves needed here, as each tile shows right on it how to move each piece. The neat bit here, the really brilliant bit part, is that once you move a tile, you have to flip it over to the other side, which usually has a completely different set of moves on the other side. And this game is fantastic for people of all ages. My son loves this game and, and, re and requests it all the time. That is The Duke. Now, another chess-like game we both enjoy a lot is Onitama. Now, this one's lighter and quicker than the Duke, but can actually be more thinky and more cerebral as it's all about completely open information from start to finish. In this abstract strategy game, there are five cards in play, and each card shows how you move your pieces. Now, the neat bit here is that you start with two cards, your opponent has two cards, and there's one in the middle, and after you make a move, they take that card from the middle and the other one goes to the middle and you end up having to hand the move you just used over to your opponent. So you really have to plan ahead and be careful you're not helping the other player more than you're helping yourself with your moves. And that was Onitama. Now Lost Cities is a Rainier Nitsia card game that Deanna and I actually played when we were dating um, as the coffee exchange downtown where we like to meet had a copy of the game. Now, this is a somewhat mathy card game where you're trying to make sets of cards played into a tableau where you have to make sure they go into ascending order. You can only play a card if it's higher than the card that's already there. Now, this can be difficult because there's only one of each card in the deck and you're both competing over the same cards. Now, it also includes a rather neat push your luck betting element where you can basically bet that you're going to do really well in one color or another and then you're going to score really well or be punished if you manage to complete that expedition, as they're called, or not. While this is an older game, it really does still stand the test of time. So do not pick up the four-player version Rivals. Yes, this is Lost Cities not, I can stress, not Lost City Rivals. I think now it's named Lost Cities the Classic Card Game. And the latest version actually comes with a sixth expedition, which is an optional new color you can add to it to make the card counting and math even harder. Next, I have The Fox in the Forest. This is a two-player trick-taking card game that honestly, like I, when I heard two-player trick-taking, I'm like, come on, that, that can't work. But it does, and it works really well. I had my doubts completely at first, but after one play, I was sold. Now, like most trick-taking games, playing well is a mix of bluffing, card counting, and playing the odds. Now, neat bits here include a system where you want just the right amount of tricks. If you take too few, your opponent wins the round. But if you take too many, you bust, and your opponent wins that way too. So you need to go for the middle ground. Now, if the two of you prefer cooperative rather than competitive games, which I totally get, pick up the Fox in the Forest duet. Instead, share some similar mechanics, but is a cooperative trick-taking game. That is The Fox in the Forest and or The Fox in the Forest duet. Now, credit for this one goes to Sean, and I probably should let him talk about that this one, but that is Jaipur. This is a very solid two-player game about trading goods and camels. You manage your hand, excuse me, managing your hand of goods and turning in sets of goods to collect tokens. 
Now, the more cards you put in your set, the more tokens you get with like the four, fives, and six being really good. But the tokens drop in value the more that are bought, which leads to the interesting choice of whether to sell early and take tokens while they're high value or save up so you have lots of goods so you get lots of tokens. This is actually considered one of the best two-player only games of all time with multiple awards under its belt. And you can get some fantastic digital versions of this as well. So you can get it on your on phone and do pass and play type stuff as well. And that is Jaipur. Next, we have some bigger board games. Uh, while still being pretty easy, fairly quick and somewhat small, these may be better suited to a hotel room or a night at the cabin instead of at the beach or at a winery. So first up is Quirkle. This is a fantastic mass market tile placement game that is like Scrabble with shapes and colors and without a board. At least that's how I usually describe it to non-gamers. This is a great family weight game with enough strategy to keep hobby gamers happy as well. If you're worried about space, you can also pick up Travel Quirkle, but it needs a smaller footprint as the original game can spread quite far depending on how players place their tiles. And that is Quirkle or Travel Quirkle. Note there is also Quirkle Cubes, which I enjoy, but it takes up more space. It's bigger, and again, we're looking for smaller stuff. Next, I have Splendor, which is a great gateway engine building game. One of the great things about this game is how portable it can be as long as you throw out the original box. A few tiles, a deck of cards, and some really sweet poker-like chips is all you need to play Splendor. You're going to collect chips and then turn them in to buy cards that themselves provide you with free gems that you can use each turn to buy better cards that provide you with more gems that'll let you buy better cards that are worth points that also you can collect sets of to try to score some nobles. That's honestly pretty much it. Uh, this is a ridiculously popular game with the list of awards on here is honestly so long that on my monitor, I can't see it all at once. I have to scroll up and down to see all the awards. Yeah, I, some people uh, are, are probably over Splendor. I know some people yeah. sort of get sick of it, but I still uh, definitely enjoy it. That is Splendor. Now, there are expansions for it. I know I haven't tried any, but if you are tired of it, that might be a way to keep it interesting. Next, I have another series of games because Ticket to Ride New York was a one of, like, honestly, my biggest surprise. Whatever year that came out, whatever year I got, I think it was 2019 because I first played it on New Year's. Um, for the first time I ever played the game, Sean had come down and we broke it out. And I'm like, this was a gift from my sister-in-law. And it's not that I'm saying she bought a bad gift, but I wasn't expecting it to be a, nearly as good as it was. This is a, I was shocked by how good it was from our first play. This is a Ticket to Ride game that's much smaller, much quicker, but still gives you that feel of Ticket to Ride, of, of taking the risk on getting routes and pushing your luck and stealing routes and cutting people off and so on. Now, I found New York also the best way, in my opinion, to play Ticket to Ride two players. So it does play one to four, or sorry, two to four. There's no solo rules that I know of. So I, I dig it because I do not like Ticket to Ride two players in the full game. It's just the board's too open. Now, since playing New York, another of a number, sorry, a number of other games have come out in this series, which includes London, Amsterdam, and the very soon to be released Ticket to Ride San Francisco which seems to have a nice pride theme to it. You've got a rainbow logo on the top, though I got to say the art looks like it might also be going for the hippie 60s look too. But that one's not even out yet. It will be, as all of these are, a ticket, a ticket to ride? No, a Target exclusive. Ticket to Target. A Ticket to Target exclusive for the first few months, but you'll be able to get it everywhere. And, I mean, personally, I don't like Ticket to Ride. I, I will never play Ticket to Ride. Never eagerly ask to play Ticket to Ride, although I will begrudgingly play it if offered. Uh, but Ticket to Ride New York was great because it's Ticket mm -hmm. to Ride in 15, 15 minutes or less, yeah. which means you don't have to, even if you don't like it, it's still over quickly, <laughs> so it's fine. Well, there's, uh, there's, there's a shining review. It was, it, it really was a, a surprising game. Again, it was a yeah. uh, 2018 release, and again, 2019, I think uh, January 2019 is when we first played it, and it really yeah, was so. an enjoyable game because it was quick you you don't even if you don't like ticket to ride you don't have time to not like this game it's just <laughs> fun and quick you don't have time to not like there there isn't a unique perspective on why the game's actually fun because you don't have to play it too long hey whatever works i'll admit it i dig it i actually really like new york i, I that's another one of those ones where i've sold copies because i basically show it to people and like wow that really is good 
Uh, next, I have one that I'm sure everyone in the chat's been waiting for me to mention. mention and they just weren't sure where it was going to be in here, and that is the Azul series of games. This is one that Deanna and I do tend to bring with us on trips. Uh, what we're still looking to pick up at some point is a two-player player mat um, that'll fit nice on a bar. Um, this is also the go-to game for our friends Tori and Kat who bring to the cottage. Azul is now their cottage game. Uh, this is an abstract tile laying game that one, is one of the most well-balanced and elegant games in my collection. The fact that it has fantastic components, honestly, it's just icing on the cake. Now, well, I recommend the original Azul for the average group of players, especially families. If you do like a bit more meat, check out Summer Pavilion. Or if you want just a bit of brain burn, look for Stained Glass of Sintra. Now, if that's not heavy enough, early reviews are in indicating that the latest Azul game, Queen's Garden, is by far the heaviest of the bunch. Now, I personally haven't had a chance to try that one yet to see where it falls on my personal scale. Of all of those so far, Summer Pavilion is my favorite. Yeah, I, I have to say, right, given, given the choice, I will actually default to the basic Azul, you know, straight Azul, mm -hmm. Azul. Uh, but, uh, and, and stained glass of Sintra just hasn't done it for me. And also, I don't really know how well that one would travel as well as some of the other ones too. Yeah. It's got, you got the, all the separate cards, all the little and... cards and things, but those are the games of Azul. Next, I have another classic. I, what I like about this list is we're, we're going to, we're going to go the gamut from, from old classics to somewhat new hotness. Um, San Juan, this is the Puerto Rico card game, which I don't even know if it's met, uh, sold that way. At the time, Puerto Rico was the number one game in the world. So it was, of course, this, the Puerto Rico card game. I don't know if that's still, but San Juan, this is one of the first games to feature multi-use cards. Honestly, it might be the first. I don't actually know. Where your hand of cards not only represent your buildings that you can build, but also the resource you have to pay to build things. So you're like, if I want to build the market, I got to discard these four other buildings. But you know what? I really want this building for later. And that's always been a fascinating decision. Now, to this day, this is one of the best action selection games out there where you're going to pick a role and everyone else gets to do something based on the role you picked. These mechanics are going to sound familiar because so many games have built off on this. This is one of the like, gateway foundation tableau builders. Now, I'll admit, personally, I prefer Race for the Galaxy, which is an evolution of this. San Juan, though, is much more portable with a smaller box, less cards and simpler rules. So in my opinion, belongs on this list more than race does, even though I do prefer race. And the uh, second edition box claims the card game based on the highly acclaimed strategy game, Puerto Rico. So it's <laughs> still is... there, but it's not like part of the name anymore. And that is San Juan. All right. I said we're going to have some new games on here. So that, this is probably the newest game on the list, which is Land versus Sea. And honestly, I was thinking old and crusty at the time, because when I was working on this list, I almost put Carcassonne here. But then Deanna reminded me about Land vs. Sea, which we have said pretty much like in a way kills Carcassonne. For your basic tile laying game, this is a better one. Now, this is my go-to light, relaxing tile laying game. One of the best things about Land vs. Sea is the various ways to play, both at different player counts and mixing and matching the three optional rule modules. If it's just you and the kids, just play the Blaze game. You got a group of gamers gathering together, toss in the trade routes, the mountains and coral, and the waypoints. Now, another highlight is just how well this game plays at all player counts, with actually the team version would be perfect for playing adults versus the kids, or if you're going on a trip with someone else, couple versus couple. That is land versus sea. Now, since I didn't put Carcassonne on, I felt I still had to pick something from that era, so I decided to include Alhambra. Now, similar to Splendor, this is another game that can be condensed down to a pretty small package once you toss out the box and the insert. Now, Alhambra is a classic game that still fascinates me because still nothing else has done a market like Alhambra has. It's almost auction-like, where you're, you're going to pay your money, but if you pay exact, you get to go again, and you can overbid, but you lose the money. Like, there's some neat stuff going on there. And then it's got unique tile placement rules with the walls and then the variable timing scoring system. More games need that where you're like, you know, how about one third of the way through the deck, you're going to score sometime, but you don't know when. Not enough games use that. This is a game that honestly, every time I play it, I'm like, man, we should play Alhambra more often. Man, Alhambra is good. Why don't we play Alhambra more often? Now, if you do ever get sick of the core game, there are a ton of expansions out there. 
And if you're actually somehow new to Alhambra and never actually got to check it out, what I recommend is looking for the big boxes, which will get the big game and like eight of those expansions all in one. Though I have to say, if you do pick up the newest, which is actually Alhambra, the mega box, it's probably not all that portable for your vacation. No, I would just bring the base <laughs> game, I would think. Yes, sorry. I, I probably should have been more clear. Do not pile the, it, it's like, you know, the, we'll do the Marvel United. That's what you should bring on vacation is Marvel United with all the expansion packs. It'll keep you busy for months and months on and, your and vacation. cost you $1,000 in luggage uh, fees. Yes, in luggage. Well, they're light enough. That one was Alhambra, getting a little distracted there. Next, I have the Unlock Games, another group of games. It works well, right? Because these these are, uh, the, the credit here goes to Deanna for this, because I hadn't even considered these. Now, as soon as she said Unlock, I'm like, oh, what about Exit? I'm like, oh, no, wait, actually, most of the Escape Room games have fiddly bits. They have lots of little components, um, stuff you have to cut out, or you might need scissors or glue or tape to even be able to complete them. The unlock games, you need a phone or tablet and the deck of cards that comes with the game. Now, this is another one where you could easily pack up a game or two or three, like pick up, sorry, go buy like one, two or three of the unlock games and then just take the card decks. I would just throw them into Ziploc baggies and be able to bring three, six or 12 adventures with you because you get three in a box when you buy these. Now, they used to be separate, but now when you buy an unlock game, you get three separate adventures at three different difficulties. And literally all you need is these tarot sized cards to be able to play. Uh, they also have the advantage of being able to play solo, which is something we didn't really highlight on this list, but you may be going to vacation on your own, or you might need something to do while the kids are gone swimming. And that is the Unlock Games. All right, we're at the end of my list tonight. My final game is a role-playing game, because here at Tabletop Bellhop, we're not just about board games. Now, in general, you probably don't want to bring a full traditional RPG with you on vacation unless maybe that vacation is to go to a game con. Most RPGs require a lot of books and other ephemera like dice, minis, scenery, and who knows what else, spell books and spell trackers and dice jails and whatever other things you use in your games. The game I recommend is For the Queen. This is an improv style role-playing game that fixes this problem by being a single deck that's pretty much the size of your standard Rider White tarot card deck. You get the deck and the box and that's it includes everything you need to play, including all the rules, which are just on cards. Now, besides being highly portable, For the Queen is my favorite improv RPG experience. And I just love the way that you start off in the game kind of fumbling around, answering your questions, and not really knowing how, you, how to answer. But then at the end of the game, you end up having this like fleshed out, detailed character that you end up caring a lot about. And you usually have a very solid opinion on what you think of the Queen by the end of the game. And that was... For the Queen. Although now that you mention that, I have to say, two dice and like 10 sheets of paper, and you can have a full game of masks as long as your GM is experienced. You, you don't have to have everything memorized. I was thinking, you know what? Like, well, no, as long as you have the sheets, your, your character sheet contains pretty much everything you ever yeah, need I guess as a PBTA player. Is pretty good for that. And, and the, the GM just has to know all the, all the rules and maybe, you know, one sheet of the basic, um, the basic rules to, get, to be able to hand out. See, I was also thinking laser and feelings or mm -hmm. our, our personal favorite var variant of Rocker Boys and Vending Machines, there you go. which is literally a one page RPG. Yeah. And all you need is one D6. So there are others out there, but I picked one that I own that I would bring. Well, as we like to do for all these game recommendation lists, we also have three honorable mentions for you tonight. All right. Number one, uh, this one, number one honorable mention. This one's funny because. I'm working on this list tonight, and I took some time to wander around my game room looking for great games to bring on a trip that I might not have thought of when sitting here at my desk and looking through my BGG collection and Googling what other people put on their list. While doing this, I spotted a small box card game on my pile of shame. Well, technically, it's above my miniature display case. It's sitting up there with a bunch of other small box things, and I'm like, Brew Crafters? Man, when did I get that? This is Brew Crafters, the travel card game, or Brew Crafters travel card game from Dice Hate Me Games. Now, Brew Crafters is a, a medium to heavy Euro about brewing beers. Well, they put out a travel version. I had totally forgotten about this game. And honestly, how have we not brought this on a trip? Like, like what Deanna and I tend to do on our trips is go to breweries and brew pubs where we're, we're old, we're, I don't know, we're, we're beer grognards. We're, we're, I don't think we're cool enough to be hipsters, so we got to be something. Um, and and we, we sit at breweries and like, how can we not be in a brew pub 
and playing a game about brewing craft beer. Like, how did we miss this? Now, I actually sat down and read the rules for the game. And honestly, it sounds like a light, quick, playing, solid game. So I feel confident tossing it in the honorable mentions. Now, this is going to be one of our quickest turnovers on honorable mentions because I'm bringing this with us tomorrow. So we're going to be playing this in a brewery, most likely the Banded Groups Brewery. And you'll get to hear about next week if it uh, belongs to have a spot further up on the list. Well, that is Brew Crafters, the travel game. And I think one of the reasons why uh, a lot of people don't necessarily know about it is fans of Brew Crafters are used to a game that's a weight of 3.57. Yes. Whereas Brew Crafters, the travel card game is a 1.32. Yeah, so they definitely sound... aim at different markets. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but that is Brew Crafters, the travel card game. Yes. The, the original you don't want to bring. It's a big box and it's heavy. There is a lot of cardboard in that box, but you get these awesome little six pack tokens that you collect. It's awesome. All right. My next honorable mention is I'm going to word this this way on purpose. The Settlers of Catan Travel Edition, because it's the old printing with the old owners where every game wasn't just Catan. This was from Cosmos. Yes. Thames and Cosmos Catan game. This is a small box portable version of Catan that comes with this really nice plastic board. The board has bumps on it that are the numbers, and you get little tiny hexagonal tiles that you slot into this to create your terrain. And then there's all kinds of holes to peg in your cities, roads, and villages. You even get little tiny um, port tiles that actually slot into the right spots. This is a fantastic small footprint version of Catan that is like so close to exact to the original. The only thing you can't do is you can't randomize the numbers. That's the one problem with this compared to the rest of them. And the desert's always in the middle. So it's just like, but it's so close. You get the full Catan experience, just tiny. Now, the reason this isn't on the main list is this is long, long, long out of print. Though I did notice like Noble Knight has some copies and they're on eBay. And I've been in game stores that had a copy of this still on their shelves. So I think it's still out there. So now this was followed up by Catan Traveler. Again, new printing. This seems like an even better vacation game because it's a fold up hex that folds into a carrying case and it has compartments to hold all the cards and playing pieces and even a little dice tray that you take out. And like these compartments come off, so you hold the cards and they have like a clip on the top. So like if you're at a, on, on a windy beach, they're not going to blow away. The thing is the train set. There's no randomization. You're going to be playing on the same Catan board, with the same numbers with the same terrain in the same place every time. And well, this one is also out of print and you're not going to be able to find it. But if you can find either, I actually recommend the older one for gameplay, the newer one for better for vacationing, if that makes sense. Yeah, and it's actually a uh, Catan Traveler Compact Edition is the newer version. Um which is still, again, probably out of print. 2015 was the last print. Yeah, as far as I could tell, it, it seems to be gone. So Catan, uh, the Settlers of Catan Portable Edition or Catan Traveler Compact Edition, if you there get you your go. hands on them. My final honorable mention is, again, their series of games, and that is the tiny epic games from Gameling Games. The entire point of these games is to give you a big box game feel and a smaller package with shorter player time which makes these perfect travel games for hobby board gamers. Now, the reason I put these down on the honorable mentions is that I haven't loved any of these games. Like they're okay, but to me, they're just a bit too heavy to be light, fun vacation games, but they're not meany enough to like scratch the, I played a nice epic game feel. Like for me, every one I played, I'm like, I'd rather just go play a bigger game. Like instead of Tiny Epic Galaxies, let's, let's go play Eclipse. Or if I'm on vacation, or like, well, you're, I'm playing Tiny Epic Alley, it's a little fiddly, like, give me something a little more fun. So it just, they don't hit the sweet spot for me, but I think especially the, like, the cabin games, the, 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 the possibly at, at, at uh, like, a board game cafe or something like that, where you have a table, and if you're into heavier games, this, they might scratch the itch for you, they're just not for me. And there are a lot of Tiny Epic games out there yes. for you to try. Right now, Tiny Epic Vikings just launched on Kickstarter at the time we're recording this episode. It like launched this week. And I think, that's the latest one. I think, yeah. And the, the, the most recent to retail is Tiny Epic Pirates, I believe. Yeah, that sounds about right. So that's it for our gaming vacation suggestions. Hopefully you found something new to bring with you on your next trip. If we missed any of your favorite games, be sure to let us know about them 
in the comments below. We're here to answer your gaming and game night questions. If you got a question for us, head over to the website, click on Ask the Bellhop, fire off an email to questions at tabletopbellhop.com or hit me up on social media.